Hello there. In our Let's Get Medieval episodes, I've often spoken about manuscripts and different versions of texts and different manuscripts, and I figured, why not dive into what a manuscript really is? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go into the nitty gritty of the manuscript making process. Welcome aboard the International Express to Book Central. Grab a seat, settle in, and let's get medieval. I'm your host, Jules, and that's what we're doing today, talking about manuscripts. So we're going to dive into what vellum is, so what manuscripts are made of, how that process works, what needs to be done in order to make an animal skin suitable for writing, how it's then stretched, and then kind of what the different steps are before you get a manuscript that we might recognize nowadays. So those are the different kind of sections that we're going to go through. Now, admittedly, the creation of vellum might not be suitable for vegans. <laughs> it's going to require some animal skins, but I'll do my very best to not make it too gory. <laughs> so, with all of that said, let's dive in. Now, I've just used the term vellum, and you might think, wait, what is that? I thought medieval manuscripts were made of parchment. Well, actually, the two are very related, but there is a slight nuanced difference, which might be important if you want to get your details right. On the one hand, we have parchment, and that is writing material used for manuscripts, and it's made from the skin of animals. Usually, parchment refers to the uh, skin of sheep, calves, and goats. So that is kind of the nuanced difference there, because vellum is distinguished by the fact that it's made from calf skin rather than the skin of any other animal and usually vellum was of a little higher quality than parchment just purely because of the skin i think it's usually very smooth and durable but that really depends on how it's made as well the word vellum actually comes from the old french vellin calf skin which comes from the latin vitulinum which means made from calf. So that's kind of our first difference there. So I've spoken about vellum so far, but I might just move back to the general parchment so that it's all clear. So the question really is, how is parchment made? Well, the first thing that you're really going to have to do if you want to make a medieval manuscript is think ahead. It's not like Word, where you can add writing, delete some, copy and paste, open up a new document if you want to save some part but not have it in the main text. If you want to make a medieval manuscript with parchment or vellum, you're going to have to plan ahead. So you're going to have to know roughly how much you're going to write, how you want that roughly laid out, and then based on that, you know how many animal skins you need so that you can make sure you have the right amount for all of your text. So first, it's planning. And then, for example, if you've planned that all out, you're a monk at a monastery and you're like, okay, great, I'm going to have to copy the Bible, but not the entire Bible. I only need to copy Genesis, for example. Then you can be like, okay, that's this many columns of text that falls across this many folios and choirs, terms I'll explain later. So I need, let's say, 10 animal skins. Now, you've decided how many skins you need. So now the animals need to be slaughtered and then skinned. That gives you the hide. But as you can imagine, this hide will have hair on one side and gross stuff on the other side. So the first thing that happens is that it gets soaked in water for about a day. Then the dehairing process starts. And everything I've heard and read, because people still make parchment to this day, so everything I've kind of seen is that the stuff that gets used in order to get rid of the hairs is that it stinks to high heaven. <laughs> so this is not a process that will make your nose very happy. The skins get put in there for a pretty long amount of time. So I think this can take at least a week, if not maybe a week and a half. And depending on how it goes, it can take even longer. So just to make sure that the hair is completely removed. A downside to this is that because that kind of solution they use 
to soak the skin in is that if it stays in there for too long, it can actually affect the skin itself and then you won't be able to go through with the next step. Because the next step is stretching. So after the skin has soaked, it's then placed on what they call a stretching frame. So it's basically just a simple frame where they then stretch the hides across and they get kind of wrapped maybe with ropes or leather strips so that both sides can dry, but also so that they can be scraped. And that removes the last of the hair. Usually the scraping was done with a knife and of course, it'd have to be very careful to make sure not to nick or cut the skin in any way, because of course they want to be writing on the parchment afterwards. The good thing though is that the skins were made of collagen, which means that they would really dry and stiffen properly so that they kind of keep their form. They don't just kind of slump into a heap afterwards. So at this point, we have a stretched surface, but it still is very much an animal skin. Often they use different kind of treatments to make it look a little bit nicer, to maybe make it a uniform color, for example. But this really all depended on how fancy the manuscript was supposed to be and if they needed it to be of uniform color or not. I mean, if this manuscript is going to be a gift to your local count or lord, then yeah, you want it to look a little bit nicer. But if this manuscript or this parchment is just intended to provide you with space to write, I don't know, your monastery accounting, then maybe it doesn't need to look as nice. As I mentioned, of course, with the animal skin, you will have two different sides to it. There's the side that was on the outside of the animal, which has fur, and then there's the other side. We actually do make a differentiation between that. We call it the hair side and the flesh side. And the reason that we can make that difference is because when you take a very close look at parchment or vellum, you can actually kind of see where the hair sacs would have been. And sometimes you can also still see veins kind of running through on the other side. That might feel a little bit gross, but it's actually very interesting. So at this point, the animal skin, the hide has been dehaired, it has been stretched, and it has dried to the point that it can now be considered parchment, which means we're kind of entering into the next stage, which is preparing the manuscript. As I mentioned at the beginning, a very important part of making a manuscript is planning ahead. So usually they would already know how many, well, I guess what we would call pages, they needed, except that pages wasn't really the measurement they used in the Middle Ages. Instead, they would think about folios and choirs. So to start with the bigger unit, which is a choir, a choir is a group of several sheets of animal skin put together. And this was really the basic writing unit throughout the Middle Ages. A choir, so a group of sheets, would be made up of folios, which are a single sheet. And you may have heard the term folios before already. So a folio is really one big sheet, which then has a number of different sides. So we often refer to the recto and the verso side of a um, folio. And well, what do recto and verso mean? Well, they are shortened from Latin terms. So we have recto folio, which means the right side of the leaf. And then we have verso folio, which means the back side of the same leaf. In countries where we read from left to right, your recto would be on the right side, it would be the right page. And then as you flip that, on the left you have the back side of the page. So that's basically how you need to envision that. So a folio would have a recto and it would have a verso. So to give you some numbers which might help, although it might also be confusing, in which case I apologize. But imagine you made up your choir of four double sheets. So four sheets of animal skin that can be read on the front and on the back. Once you fold that, you would have eight folios. So you would have eight sections which can be read on the front as well as on the back. Overall, that gives you 16 pages. Now, it very much depends on what kind of animal skin you have, how big it is, how many choirs you can get out of it. Because 
a skin might not be very large. So maybe you can only really get one sheet out of it. Or maybe it's very big and you get two or three. And what is actually quite fun is that in a lot of manuscripts we can see for example that the edges aren't entirely straight because it was just the end of the skin so there's maybe a little part missing or there's maybe a little hole <laughs> or there's only half a page because that's what was left and that's always a really fun insight into how these things were made so we're a little bit further in the process now we have we have prepared our skin we've turned it into parchment and we have prepared the materials that we kind of really need for the writing. Except there's still some other steps to go, of course, and I don't know what it's like for you, but my handwriting is not necessarily good enough that I can just write on a blank sheet of paper. I do need my lines. And the same was true for the Middle Ages. So something that they would do, and which we can still see evidence of in manuscripts as well, is called pricking, where they would basically prick little holes in the sheets uh, in preparation to then have it ruled so that different lines are being created on which they can then enter the text. This was usually done on horizontal lines, but there would also kind of be vertical kind of boundary lines that would show you where a column of text would end. And in some manuscripts we can see that actually they didn't need all the space and therefore we can still kind of see the lines that were made to bound off where it was meant to end. So now, basically, we have our material in the sense that we have our parchment. We have measured out what the sheets are, how many we need, and we've created columns for our writing so that basically we can get started in copying the text that we need onto this parchment. An important note is that the sheets would not have been folded and bound yet. So even though they would have already measured out how many they need and how they were meant to then form together, they would have usually still been loose when the writing was done. And that, of course, is kind of an extra tricky thing. I don't know if you've ever had to create a flyer, for example, where you know that, okay, once this gets printed off, it needs to be folded in this and this way. So the last thing will actually be the second page. And if I fold this way, that will be the front. It requires quite a lot of, well, in my opinion, <laughs> mental arithmetic <laughs> to figure out and kind of spatial thinking to figure out how will these different pages fit together because they don't automatically follow up on one another. If we go back to, for example, our choir made up of four sheets, if you think of the one that will be lying on top, those are actually the innermost folios and the innermost pages that you have. Whereas the sheet that's on the bottom of your pile will be the first as well as the last page. So you really need to know where which text is going to go. And this is why you have to plan it in advance. Because if you made a mistake, you would have to scrape off all your ink and it would damage the manuscript and it would just not look good. And that is not the vibe. So at this point, we have created our little columns so that we know where to write certain things. Some manuscripts, and those are usually the manuscripts that we see fancy pictures of, are illuminated, which means they have illuminations, which is a fancy word for illustrations. Now, just because we always see photos of these manuscripts does not mean every manuscript was illuminated. Absolutely not. Colors and pigments and dyes were incredibly expensive, especially the very pretty, like, blue ones, for example. So, most manuscripts do not have any illuminations or illustrations at all. That was really safe for manuscripts that were meant to be important, that were going to be a gift, that were meant to be status objects in a sense as well. Most manuscripts will just have columns upon columns of writing without any pictures. But if they were going to add pictures, then they would have created space for those in advance. So as they would prick and rule the columns where the text would go, they would also figure out where they want to place certain illuminations. Sometimes, if the manuscript that they were copying the text from also had illuminations, then they would just place them in the same way. So they would say, okay, so my exemplar, my example text, has an illumination on folio 3 recto, so then that's also where we're going to put that illustration. But sometimes they would change it around. 
Important note, the person who would be writing the text, so the scribe, is not the same person, usually, as the one who then did the illuminations. What we also see in certain manuscripts is that space was left for an illumination, but the artist simply never got around to it. So there's just a little blank space where clearly a drawing or, uh, or colors or pigments were meant to go. But now we have all of that laid out, we know where we're going, and now the writing starts. So this is where the scribe comes in. And they would, quite simply, as you can imagine, write the text down. Most scribes in the Middle Ages were monks because Christianity also introduced the art of writing. So those were quite simply the people who were usually the most educated and most of those were also men. We don't have names for most scribes. It's not like all of them wrote their name down and said, Brother Anselm wrote this on the 5th of December 1022. Although some did, which is always very fun. But most of our scribes are anonymous. We have no idea who wrote these texts down, but we have them. And that is the most important part. As I'm sure anyone who takes notes frequently, whether it's for work, for school, or anything else, your hand gets tired after a while. And that means that creating a manuscript, writing the text down, was an incredibly long and tiring process. Just imagine how long it might take you to copy a poem in a way that you think looks nice. And now imagine you have to do that for 20, 30 folios. And it has to look nice and readable. So being a scribe was a very impressive job, in my opinion. And there were people who would do this pretty much as their career. That was their role within the monastery. Some monasteries had a scriptorium, so they had a place where these manuscripts would be created. For example, Canterbury is quite well known for creating a lot of manuscripts and also having a pretty big library, but it would take a while for your manuscript to get through the writing phase. Sometimes multiple scribes would be working on the same manuscript, so Brother Anselm would be writing the first part and then Brother Roderick would come in and finish it off or maybe they would go back and forth. And we actually can kind of note differences in people's styles from the writing. We can see certain scribes writing very carefully, and then we can see others just being a little bit sloppier. And that's always quite fun <laughs> to get to see differences in how people approach the text. Now, as I said, they would usually be working from an exemplar. So from a different text, which maybe was on loan to them so that they could copy it, and then they would return the exemplar, and then they would have their own copy of it. And that meant that these scribes would be reading, and then writing, reading, then writing, etc. And as you can imagine, sometimes that led to people maybe missing a line, repeating certain words. If the same word gets used in two sentences that follow each other directly, maybe their eye would accidentally jump over an entire sentence. So there's all these little kind of differences, which means that every manuscript, even if it tells the same story as other manuscripts, is different in its own way. Because little changes get made, little things get missed, and we also have scribes who clearly thought, I don't think this is necessary in this story, or I don't need that part of it. Or in this section of the tale, it's referring to a place in France, but we happen to be in Iceland, so we don't need that. And that is how we get so much what they call mouvants and variants in these different medieval texts, because every manuscript is a slightly new adaptation of material. So now we have stretched our skins, prepared them, we've created folios, we have written our text into it, the next step would be for the illuminations to be added if they are necessary. So the final step would be to bind the book. So at this point, we would have the choirs actually being formed. So the, the pages or the, the leaves and the sheets would actually get folded into kind of an ordered stack of sheets, which are in the right order and then they would be bound together, usually into a codex style book. So you might have already heard of a codex before. It's basically the 
ancestor of just the modern paperback or hardback. So instead of just being loose sheets, they are then bound together. And this form of bookmaking has actually existed, I think, since the 5th century at the very least, but I think it actually already came up in the Roman Empire. So that form of reading books is pretty old. There are also scrolls. They were still kind of quite popular, I would say, in the early, early Middle Ages, but they got replaced pretty quickly. So now you're binding the book, you're binding all the folios together, making sure they line up nicely, and then you bring in covers. And these are usually hard covers. So they might be made out of wooden boards, for example, and they might be covered in leather. If you have a very fancy manuscript that you want to present to a king or an emperor, which absolutely happened, then this would become a very fancy cover. So you might add gemstones or illustrations on the cover, use really nice leather instead of wooden boards, and all of that. But most manuscripts just had two slabs of wood. Now, of course, a wooden cover covered in leather and maybe using metal to keep all of that in place, that's not great for your parchment. So quite often, they would also add fly leaves. So those would be bits of parchment they just had flying around, which would go over the title page, so between the title page and the cover, to make sure that the cover and the book itself would not be harmed. What is actually interesting is that these little scraps of parchment that would get used for fly leaves were quite often bits from old manuscripts that they didn't need anymore, or bits of parchment where people had been doodling or practicing, etc. So every time we, I see a new manuscript, I always find the fly leaves very interesting as well to kind of see, okay, where does this come from? Is this part of a different text or is there anything kind of funny or personal written on it that give me an insight into what medieval life was like? And a project I once worked on uh, back in the Netherlands, we actually got to look at some fly leaves for an incunabula, which is one of the first sort of printed texts. And they'd actually used an old medieval manuscript of a Cicero text. And that was really fun to look at and be like, okay, so they had this text from Cicero on rhetoric, but they clearly didn't need it anymore. Maybe it was a bad copy or maybe they'd found a new version and they just didn't want this. And to then kind of look at it and be like, okay, so how would this have made it there and why did they use it here? And that can make medieval studies something of a detective work, which is always fun. Manuscripts were really the basic way of copying down text from most of the Middle Ages. And that was the case until the printing press arrived. But it's not as if the printing press was the first ever revolution of the literary arts, to put it that way. In China, during the Western Han period, so that's around 202 BC until 9 AD, they'd already been working with paper made out of hemp. So they'd already kind of introduced new improvements and different ways of actually making paper rather than using animal skin. And there were a lot of different developments in bookbinding and what I would call medieval China, although of course the Chinese culture has its own way of reckoning its history. But during the period that in Europe is the Middle Ages, China was really making different advances in forming codexes, folding things in different ways, stitching bindings in specific ways, etc. Now, that brings us, however, to the European case, because in roughly 1440 in Germany, Johannes Gutenberg invented the first movable type printing press, which started the printing revolution, and that is usually written with capital P and capital R because it did absolutely revolutionize the way in which people could access reading material. But it does need to be mentioned that it's not as if after Gutenberg invented that at the end of the 15th century that suddenly everyone had access to a printing press the way many people now maybe have printers in their home. Absolutely not. Printing was also very expensive, and there were a lot of debates about what good literature is. It's no surprise that the first thing Gutenberg printed was a Bible, because there were a lot of discussions, uh, which we can kind of pick up from different hints in texts and manuscripts, 
about what should be printed, whether it was maybe a bad thing that so much writing would now be available to the masses. So kind of think of the uproar about, oh, the kids are always on their mobile phones. At the end of the 15th century, yeah, people saying, oh, the kids will always be stuck with their noses in printed books when they should just be in the fields working or something. <laughs> so that has also always been part of our history. But with the printing press, there was a change in how literature became kind of more widespread because it did simply make books more accessible. It reduced the time that it took to create something. And they'd already been working with paper a little bit more around that time, but the printing press just really sped the entire thing up. The first few printed texts, I would say from the last quarter of the 15th century to maybe a little after the turn into the 16th century, are usually referred to as incunabula. And then after that, we just speak of printed books. So that was an almost half hour long introduction to the art of making a manuscript. There are a lot of different steps to it. A lot of it is very labor intensive, especially the part of actually turning an animal skin into parchment or vellum that takes a lot of time, dedication and also strain. And let's not forget how bad it is for your back to be bent over in a room with no electric light, but only maybe candles and sunlight to constantly be bent over writing and writing. So all the manuscripts we have, even if by now they look old and a little faded and they're not pretty because they don't have nice pictures in them, they're all such works of art, even if they don't look pretty, but there's so much human ingenuity, creativity, dedication, and perseverance in each manuscript. And I'm just so glad that so many, many of them have still made it. I'm also not mad that we've switched to paper and printing because that is a lot easier, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I still have a massive respect for the time and effort that went into manuscripts every time I get to hold one. Little note, when you're working with manuscripts, you don't need to wear fancy white gloves, even if they like to do that in the documentaries on TV. They do that because it looks fancy, but actually when it comes to parchment, it is better if you use your fingertips because that way you can actually be more gentle with the paper. You can feel if it's fragile or not, whereas with gloves, that might not be the case. If you're working with papyrus, which was created way earlier and usually is from the classical or antiquity period, you should be wearing gloves because the oil of your skin will probably damage the leaves otherwise. But parchment is animal skin. It's oily by nature, so you can just touch that, but with care. That was plenty of information for me, I think. So with all of that said, that's it for today. If you have questions, thoughts on the book, or recommendations or requests for future episodes, feel free to leave a comment or send me an email at bookcentralpod at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. You can also subscribe to be informed when new episodes drop. You can find references to the materials used today in the description. Book Central is written and produced by me, and our music is by Scott Buckley. Thank you for joining me today on the International Express to Book Central.